Amen. Okay, I'm going to screen share. Um, I'm going to have to uh, look at how to do that. I want to screen share for the children's talk, so I'm going to try to make this work. I'll stop this video on this one and I'll come up on a, another screen. Okay, kids, what can you see in the picture there? People, okay. It's a man and a woman. They're facing each other. <laughs> you can see the two big heads? Okay, good. So that's what you're supposed to see. So it's a, um, a romantic picture. You've got a man and a lady and presumably they're in love and uh, that's their relationship. So um, if we zoom out a little bit, you can see that there's a double picture there. There's old people. And I guess by the time they're old, they're still in love. So that's a clever picture. And you can see that there's two pictures in one. Okay, Your perspective can make a difference. Uh, okay, there's another one. It's similar. So can you see the, the other picture yet? Or can you just see them? The, the first picture, can you just, can you see anything else there? I think you can. Okay, we'll zoom out a little bit. Can you see it now? What about there? What is it? It's like a man's face. Can you see that? The beard, moustache and a beard. What about that one? What if I turn it? Oh, can you see another picture there? That's clever, isn't it? How about that one? Okay, you can see a frog. If I turn it, turn it a bit more. Still see the, you can see a horse. Can you see a horse as well? Okay, good. So it's clever. And can you see this lady's face? Yeah, you, you can? Okay, can you see the person there as well? Can you see the other picture? There's the, the whole body. Let's zoom out a little bit. And you can see it a bit more clearly there, the face. What about that one? It's a bird. If I turn it. And turn it a bit more. Can you see that man? Yeah. It's a clever picture. I don't know how people do this. How about that one? Which one? What can you see there? Is it is she old or young? She's young. Okay, you can't see an old lady. Can I don't know if my mouth shows up. There's an eye. Make her ear the eye and make her necklace the mouth. And she's got a wart on her nose. So she's kind of an ugly old lady. You see? There's two pictures in one there. So one person could argue that it's a young girl and someone else could argue it's an old one. How about that one? Yeah. Can you see both? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can see like a lion and you can see like a monkey thing. Yeah. All right. So why am I showing you these? Point that I wanted to make is that some artists could draw a picture of a young couple and that would be okay. You'd say it's fairly okay art or someone could paint a picture of an old couple and that would be okay. But for an artist to put both pictures together like that, that's when we realize the artist is really amazing. What skill, very clever, I don't know how they do it. Um, how did you make that man's moustache part of the eye? You know, so that it looks like he's looking forward. You have to work out how to make the nose out of the elbows and that bottle is the earring. It's very interesting that lady coming through the door is like the ear. I don't know how this artist uh, worked that out. So we think the artist is pretty clever. And that what's that got to do with our talk today? Uh, I'm going to be talking about a prophecy in, in Isaiah today, which is a bit like that picture. You could look at that prophecy as one story. You could look at that same prophecy as another story. But when you see how they work together, that's when we realise God is really amazing. He uh, managed to combine two stories into one. And not only that, but these stories are with real people in real life. So it's quite amazing. Um, so today's talk will be about 
um, Willie Miller and Hiram Edson. And they're looking at the same thing from two perspectives and seeing two different things. But we now know that uh, you can bring them together and that's really amazing. So that's the end of my children's presentation. Okay, hopefully uh, you can see me again now on this one. So let's begin. Let's start with a little bit of review where we've been. Um, get the board good. We've been looking at the seven times of Leviticus, Leviticus 26. We've had a few presentations now. We've gone through um, some history and now we're in 2009 looking at the increase of knowledge um, that came about then a series of presentations that were done that year. Um, so I'm just going through those and revising them with you all and basically learning myself and then sharing what I learned with you. And today's focus will be on what Miller and Edson missed. So, um, okay, so I'll just... Um, just let, I'll just remind you what we did last time. Um, we looked at some criticisms about what James White and Uriah Smith had said against the interpretation of duration in Leviticus 26. Uh, we looked at some Hebrew um, and just discussed briefly that Aramaic as well, um, the word seven and the word more. And the summary of all of that was that you can't rule out time necessarily and languages are complex and it's uh, you really can go into quite a lot of depth and still get to an answer that says it's, it's really you can't rule out um, time there. So that was that. And then we went into our main subject last time as well, which was the importance of events. And um, so back in 2009, Elder Paminda had given three parables that explained um, something we could learn from. So it was using parable teaching. We had ancient Israel, the end of ancient Israel as a parable for our time. We had the parable of examinations, school examinations, and we had a parable also of the dark ages. Um, ancient Israel, the end of ancient Israel taught us that we need to um, recognize the correct events. We need to know when and what is occurring and be looking for the right signs, um, avoiding the mistake that the Jews had made in the time of Christ. Examinations, um, that was a, really taught us that the closer you get to an event, the more you need to prepare. And so that the, the awareness of the events is what motivates you to start to act. And without that motivation, we tend to um, just drift along. So we really need some stimulus to make us motivated and time and events are connected to each other and they motivate us. Also that God doesn't want to surprise us. So he doesn't want to sneak some test up on us, but it's his will that we have some awareness as well. Dark Ages was just to illustrate how, um, you know, the future time that we're going through is not going to be a walk in the park. And we need to um, just see these things as solemn um, and serious events so that we don't just um, be blase about everything. We need to be careful um, and make an effort. And then I also mentioned that in 2020 this year we had a really similar message repeated in our increase of knowledge time, <clears throat> except this time where it's sort of uh, more specific and our job now is to, um, we have to identify the correct events. So the issues are really the same. Um, it's no good looking for the wrong events. We will end up caught off guard uh, and to know the right events, we need to be following the right stream of information internally in this movement and also um, externally in the world. We need to be following the correct news stream uh, and avoiding conspiracy theories and all of that will um, end up damaging us. Uh, so now just moving forward, I'll introduce what we're going to talk about today as well. All right, so you might be able to tell me who these people are. This one, somebody was talking about 677 a lot. 
that was Miller. Then we went on and we discussed the next person who's talking a lot about 723. So I'm focusing now on the beginning points. So not, not 1843 and 1798, we're looking at the start. 677 Miller, 723 BC for Edson. This one here is James White and whoever he represents as well, coming along and saying um, seven times, uh, you know, these dates exist and everything, but they don't have to do with the seven times because we, he knows that's just intensity and it has nothing to do with time. Uh, now we're at 2009, Elder Paminda is talking about, uh, actually it's both, and so we'll be looking at that. He, I started off explaining how he addressed James White's arguments. Uh, so we looked at that already, and today we'll be looking at Elder Paminda's critique um, of Miller and Edson's point of view. So um, before we get really into the meat of this topic, which I still haven't got to yet, um, because we've got a lot to do still with this uh, increase of knowledge time. But I uh, wanted to cover these two as well, how he's going to um, critique the work of Miller and Edson. And the point isn't to um, criticise them and to disparage that what they've done. The reason that he's critiquing what they've done is because we're going to use what they've done um, and we're going to tweak them a little bit and join them together. So in order to do all of that joining together and some things need to be clarified and cleared up about their original work. So we'll be looking at um, what we're going to call Miller's mistakes and Edson's mistakes or mistake, um, however you want to look at it. Miller's got a few um, and then uh, Edson as well. So we'll be looking at both. So we'll begin now with um, my first one, which was addressing Miller. Hey, you might already have an idea of what Miller's mistakes are. I think I'm going to identify three or put them into three categories. So we're pretty aware of this, the year zero mistakes. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. 1843, we know is 1844. Um, uh, it affected a few of his calculations, this year zero mistake. So um, he had a few different ways of arriving at 1843. And so um, they were all affected. Nobody else noticed these mistakes either at the time. It just seemed to, um, people were just blinded to it somehow, maybe um, providentially. We know this was a um, God had laid his hand over some of the figures and all of that. So um, it was his design, really. So maybe he gets let off on that one. Um, so, but it's worth mentioning there. It's a mistake that affected things. Um, so I just have to mention that one. The second one, sanctuary. Okay, so the sanctuary, uh, that was a really, that one impacted his work a lot and it was really the premise that undid a lot of the um, arguments that he had, especially concerning my third point. <clears throat> okay, the sanctuary in Daniel 8, 14, uh, being interpreted as the earth. And of course, then that would imply that the second advent is 1843. And so everything else is based on that premise. Um, but that was a traditional common belief that, was held, widely held, and it wasn't really questioned. Um, and maybe that one's not so excusable. Um, and uh, that's that's how, how it happened. So that affected point three, which is Daniel 12, seven.
I'm not sure how many people are aware of this. Um, we we would okay. So Daniel twelve seven is the is one of the verses that mentions the time times and half a time, and there's two verses like that in Daniel and Miller. Instead of applying them both to the papacy, he implied, uh, applied uh, the one in chapter seven to the papacy, and the one in chapter twelve he's applied to non papal powers. So he says they're not about the same time periods. So that's that's really the main um, point that I'm going to make about, about Miller and. This really is, is because of his um, the way he that he saw 1843 based on the sanctuary point of view he had. Um, so I'm going to draw up how Miller viewed the, this line as well because we know he could see 723, um, tw which he called 722, and he knew about 1798 as well. And I'll explain um, why he goes about uh, putting Daniel 12:7 and saying it's non-papal powers, why does he do that? So this is how he sees it. This is bondage here. Okay, so bondage increases, it starts there, but it's it's fully in place here. This is the bondage of seven, um, seven years, and then this is the release. So he's looking at the, the year of release, you know, the um, antitypical sabbatical year. Um, so that's how he's placing that. So the second advent is there. Um, anything past here is basically it's after the second advent. So everything in Revelation, you know, all those things that happen would be finished by then. Um, so he needs to factor in Revelation 17. So we'll read that. Okay, so these verses can't happen after 1843 in his view. Um, okay, so Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So he's going to have to find how this is fulfilled before 1843 because he knows in his mind this is the cleansing of the sanctuary, and so Second Advent is 1843. He has to account for these verses somehow. So he finds a really, uh, you know, really clever, intelligent, and logical way to do that. Um, and he's going to, it's going to have to do with how he lays out his two 1260s as well. So I'll draw what we do with the 1260s and what he did with the 1260s again. And I've mentioned this already, but I'll, we're going to look at that again in detail, so I'll draw it up.
Hopefully with repetition, everybody's getting used to how he's done his uh, 1215 plus the um, 45. He's, uh, it's more complicated the way he's broken it up, but he's still got the two 1260s there, um, that one there, and then these two bits adding up to 1260. So that's what he's thinking in his mind. Now, when we, um, we do that, so we know that there's seven times in the Bible that this 1260 time period is mentioned. There's Daniel 7.25, Daniel 12.7, and then there's five of them in Revelation. Um, so I'll just pop them as well, just to illustrate where he's placing these verses. So this is all um, so that he can account for the second advent. And we would place, we would apply all those verses here and we would say for this section, there really isn't a Bible verse specifically for that time period. But he's going to argue that um, this one here, Daniel 12, 7, is applied to both of these sections here. Um, yes, to answer the question on the chat, are we going to post those pictures? We're taking pictures of them and we'll put them on our... Um, oh, do you want it on the chat, did you say? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, so we'll share it later, but I won't put it on the chat. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to read to you now from his own words what he's um, saying. So I've drawn it first so that you can see what his point is and then we'll talk. We'll, I'll read to you what he's written. So this is from... Um, oh, and also draw him where he's standing at the time too. Okay, so Miller's in this time period here. Um, just keep that in mind as well. Because uh, he's going to talk about things that have already happened in his past and things that he's looking for in his future. This is from William Miller, Volume 1, page 43 and going into page 44. These seven times are not yet accomplished. So he's standing here. Um, he's saying they're not yet accomplished for Daniel says when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people all these things shall be finished all these things shall be finished here I mean, while all these things he says the resurrection and judgment will take place so um, if we look at the verse actually Daniel 12 7 I will read it out to you um, because it's got two phrases there it's got the end of these wonders in verse 6 and all these things shall be finished as well so I'll read you um, Daniel 12, 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So his emphasis is on all these things in that verse. When that 1260 is finished, all these things are finished. It can't be 1798. Because to him, all these things being finished is this point here. So it has to, there has to be a 1260 that goes up to 1843. That's his logic. Uh, so he quotes those verses and then he says, What did the angel mean by time, times, and a half? I answer, he meant three years and a half prophetic or 42 months, as in Revelation 11, 13, or the 1260 in Revelation 11 and 12 and 14. Uh, verses 6 and 14. He meant the one half of seven times. 
Um, so now when he says he meant the one half of seven times, he's talking about this orange. That's what he's talking about. Um, and we know he means that by what he says further down. Daniel saw the same thing as Moses, um, and only to Daniel the time was divided. But what does that mean? Moses saw um, the same thing, but for Daniel the time was divided. He says that for Daniel it was divided. He doesn't mean it was divided in half like you would think. He says he saw it divided, divided up into pieces. That's, his, uh, that's the way he's seeing it. I'll keep reading. Um, he was informed, so Daniel was informed that the little horn would speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times and the dividing of time. That's the little horn. So he's going to put. Okay, that's the little horn there. That's that's um, that's one of the things that Daniel saw. Um, then he's going to say this makes or adds up to Moses seven times. So what does it add up to with? So he's first said that there's these other 1260, which is these ones with the kings. Okay, so Daniel could see these ones about the kings, that um, chapter 12, verse 7. Then when you add it up with the other one in chapter 7, you end up with two 1260s. It adds up to Moses' seven times, for twice three and a half are seven, and twice 1260 are 2,520 common years. But you may inquire, this is him continuing, you may inquire, are not these two things the same in Daniel? Okay, these two uh, mentions of the time, times and a half. Uh, I answer no. And now he's gonna do a compare and contrast, okay, with the two groups. He's gonna compare and contrast these kings with the little horn. Um, so have a, have a listen to his logic, okay? For their work is different and their time of exi existence is at different periods. The one scatters the holy people, the other wears out the saints. The one means the kingdoms which Daniel and John saw, that would be, you know, um, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, here as well, the ten, ten horns or the ten kings for John. So one of them mentions the kingdoms with which Daniel and John saw. The other means papacy, which is called the little horn, which had not come up when the people of God were scattered by Babylon and the Romans. The first means literal Babylon or the kings of the earth. The other means mystical Babylon or papacy. And here's the comparing bit. Both together would scatter the holy people and wear out the saints seven times or 2,520 years. So it's some um, basically separating them into two categories. Um, so whereas for us, we would split up the 21260s, we say um, paganism and papalism. He doesn't say paganism and papalism. He says kings and papacy. So he's sort of saying papacy doesn't qualify to be a king or a kingdom by doing that. Um, and he uses the term literal Babylon to describe even these kings here, you know, and all these different kingdoms here. He's still calling them literal Babylon. Um, we don't do that when we say literal Babylon. We mean literal Babylon, not uh, Greece or something else. So just the way he used the word literal Babylon is different to us as well. Um, but all of this um, he, he did because he had to factor in Revelation 17 here. These ten horns have to happen before the second advent. That's logic. Um, so, and all of that is based on this premise here the sanctuary. So that's a summary of 
um, something he did. And also I will mention as well um, how all these numbers were coming together and he got this 45 because the number 45 became really big for him. It's on, it's on the chart and everything. Um, and it, it just, everything seemed to come together for him. All the numbers lined up really well. Um, I'm just going to clear a bit of space to just list all the different ways he came to 1798, 1843, and 45. Oh. So for 1798, he had the 1290, he had the 1260, uh, he had the 2520. Okay, in support of that year, 1843. There's the 1335, the 2520. I'll put asterisks there because of the mistake. 2300, that involves crossing the zero. And there's a 2450 as well, which is uh, 49 times 50. Uh, that's the, jubil the ju Jubilee of Jubilees one. And then he gets 45. Um, that's from 1843 minus 1798, 1335 minus the 1290, and then the 1260, which is done here, minus the 1215. Okay. So to him, it looks rock solid. There's heaps of reason for him to believe that all the numbers are right. This is a 45. And this 45 is the time of the 10 kings. Okay, so that's how he's done all of that. So we'll move on to um, Edson. I suppose part of this is just to clarify what he said so that we know when we're adjusting things um, further down. Um, we can see what things we've had to tweak, I suppose, because we're they're not major changes, they're just sort of tweaks. take a bit longer. So Edson's mistake has got everything to do with the 65-year prophecy. So we're going to be looking at that today. And I'm going to introduce it um, just now. Uh, what's it got to do with the 2520? Do you even know about it? Do you know much about it? Do you know where to find it? <laughs> it's in Isaiah. Um, so we're going to look at that today. Uh, and I want to explain what this prophecy has to do with the 2520 and how it's connected. I'm going to work backwards. Okay, so we've got the twelve, uh, the 2520. Isaiah said something about 65 years back here. 
and this is in the lead up to the 2520. Um, whichever way, whichever person you ask, Miller or Edson, they're both going to say, this is important and relevant, and this has something to do with the 2520. Um, why do they say that? It's here, and the 2520, whoever's point of view you take, um, is actually later. Um, so 25 year prediction of this event, I suppose, is why. Um, so I really wanna say that the 2520 story begins here, kind of, uh, you could say it begins, begins here because this is when it's sort of like initiated. Or if you really wanna argue, we could say it goes further back to when they made the covenant. The beginning of the 2520 story probably goes as far back as the covenant because that's when, um, that's when you know, basically the, the deal was made. I want to use uh, an illustration of a seed to just explain what I mean. He's just seed. The seed is there. Okay, you made a deal with God. This is a covenant. Um, God is going to chastise you if He needs to bring you back into lines. He's got this emergency plan thing to, to put into effect if He has to. That's in the jar, though. It's on the shelf. He's not doing it yet. You get to this point here. It's like it's been planted. It's it's in effect. It's on. You're told it's coming, um, and then it will sprout but you don't see it yet. And it might be just growing up under the ground. Don't actually see it until you get here. Okay, so this is how I'm visualizing it. The debate then for these two men is, what's this date? When does it actually come into effect? Both of them know that this is um, relevant. Both of them agree on when it happened as well. So this is 742. Okay. They both agree on its importance. They both agree on when. Um, but the difference is when you apply it to. One of them will say this date is 677 BC. The other one is going to say it's 723 because by then they know 722 is really 723. Um, now, this all relates to Edson and his mistake is not that he says 723 necessarily. The mistake is that he dismissed Miller's view. Uh, it would be great if he had held on to both because it's the bringing together of these two stories. Like my children's talk, it's the bringing of them together, which is when all the information explodes or when you really appreciate God's artistry. So each of them really focused on one or the other and so they both only kind of got half the story, which would be sad in one of those fancy pictures if you only ever saw one half, it would be a bit of an ordinary picture. Um, but fortunately, uh, God has shown us more and we now get to appreciate all that wonderful light um, that's coming through this um, combining of the two. All right, so moving on to point two. Um, I've already pre-drawn it to because of all that detail. I wanted to draw it ahead of time. This is, I'm going to explain to you the panic of 742. So that's when this prophecy was given. It's given in the context of this panic situation there's history going on and if we don't get the context we won't understand the prophecy so we need to talk about that and that required um, a lot of reading as well so I hope I've got all the details right and um, if you spot a mistake you can uh, let me know later and I'll fix my uh, fix my knowledge um, but I'm hoping everything is correct so apologies in advance if it's not um, Okay, so I'm just going to talk you through what I've drawn up first and then we'll, we'll move on. So 7.42, we're here. Okay, and this is when the prophecy is given. That's why we're talking about it. So we've got ancient Israel. And I've drawn them this way. Oftentimes we draw the split of the kingdom 
a bit differently, but I want to put it together so that you can see ancient Israel is one group of people. 720 is uh, the 2520 affects the whole body of people. And so I wanted to draw it this way so that they look like uh, one group that splits in half, but they're all still Israel. Israel. Okay, we've got Saul, David and Solomon, Jeroboam and Rehoboam there. Uh, little red dots mean that they've had civil wars between the two um, nations. And I'll just skip through and we're going to Pekah and Ahaz. This is towards the end of the Northern Kingdom. This year is, and we're going to be calling it Ephraim for this section because this is what the Bible verses call it. So this is Ephraim, which is not just that tribe, but it's the group of them, 10 of them. And this is called Judah in the prophecy. Okay, so um, so that's how that split. Ahaz is the king down here. Pekah is the king up here. So that's the timeline. This is the map. Okay, very not necessarily correct, technically correct. This area may be a little higher up, but anyway. Uh, so we've got the sea here, Judah down here. I've illustrated the, the capital city as a hill. Um, oftentimes they were built on hills for um, protective measures, but um, that's how I've done it. So this is the nation surrounding it. This is uh, Jerusalem here, and this is Ahaz here. I've written the whole name out there, so uh, when you have the notes later, you know the A is for Ahaz, so that's in there. So we've got Judah, capital city is Jerusalem, and Ahaz is the king, so that's there. Ephraim here, that's Samaria, and that's Pekah, that one there. Syria, not to be confused with Assyria, that's here, and Damascus, and Rezin is the king. This also can be called Aram, or Aramea, so I'll put that there in brackets too. Ephraim is sometimes called Israel, just becomes confusing, but that's, I'll put that there in brackets. Uh, and then over here we've got Assyria, uh, Nineveh is, I believe, the capital of the time, and tiglath pileser is here. Okay, so what's going on in the Panic of 742? There's been civil war, and then you've got Pekka, he joined up with Rezin, and they decided to attack Judah together, and they were going to place someone else on the throne. They have besieged the city, and Ahaz is panicking, he's shaking, um, so he's, he's really worried. And then um, Isaiah comes to give him a message from God. Ahaz has been idolatrous. So this is God's um, chastisement on Judah. He, God is having wrath upon Judah. So all this is going on. I think they're also getting attacked from other nations too. Uh, there's a crisis and a siege. Ahaz is terrified. Um, so this is when Isaiah comes onto the scene. And this is when our prophecy comes onto the scene. So... That's Isaiah. What does he say? So I'll read you Isaiah chapter 7. I'm going to start at verse 4 and go through to verse 9. If you want to read along, you can, or you can just listen. This is what Isaiah says. Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, that's these two, or the fierce anger of resin, with Syria, this one here, or the son of Remaliah, which I probably... Well, anyway, that, that's, that's who Pekka is, the son of Remaliah. That's his other name that he's called. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. So that's who they want to put there instead of Ahaz. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus. This is partly why I've drawn it this way. The head of Syria is Damascus. That's the capital city. And the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, this one, and that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son, Pepper. If ye will not believe, they has. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So then there's a threatening against him. So here we find the 65-year prophecy, which is kind of like the prequel to the 2520. So we notice um, also going on from those verses, verses 10 to 13 now. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it in either the depth or in the height above. 
But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? And you might wonder, uh, Ahaz said, I'm not going to ask for a sign. I'm not going to tempt God. And then he's sort of told off for wearying God. So why is he told off? He actually didn't really believe. Um, he is kind of lying here. Um, we know from um, his subsequent behaviour that he did not have any faith in this prophecy. Um, the phrase I think that Ellen White used was that had he believed that this message was from God, he might have acted. So clearly he did not think this message was from God. He just thought this was a guy who showed up with a message that he could dismiss. Um, so, but anyway, he says he doesn't need a sign, but he's given signs anyway. And so if you keep reading the end of um, chapter seven and going into eight and onwards, he's told about some signs that will be given to the nation. Um, they're going to have some signs and that these signs are going to indicate the nearness of this event. So this predicted event of the fall of these two enemies, which is great news to get a message like that, um, as it gets nearer and nearer, these, there's going to be these signs. And it's a bit like that examination parable that we talked about. The closer that this event is coming, the, there's a sign for it's imminent and then there's a sign for it's like it's very imminent. So, but the reason I'm mentioning those is because these signs are given to Judah. So it's important to realise that there's um, a message about Ephraim, but the message is given to Ahaz here and Judah. And it's a conditional um, prophecy for Judah as well, as we'll, we'll look at the structure. Um, okay, so, yeah, I'll do that now. I'll look at the structure of those two verses. Okay, so you can see that there's a repeating structure. It's not quite a repeating in large, I guess, but um, the two verses match up really well. The, those, uh, that series is just being about the one entity and then the punishment applying actually to Ephraim here. The condition here is the 65 years. 
it's not it's it's not really conditional because they're just it's just a matter of time so in that sense i would say the seed is what planted sprouting or it has been initiated by this point um it's going to apply to e-frame and it'll be broken so that's that's easy we can see that applies to e-frame verse nine um the discussion here is about the nation of e-frame um I, i'm not sure but this punishment here on e-frame is because of their alliance, I suppose, could be uh, with Syria. And then this punishment here, they're supposed to look at Ephraim and learn from this. Uh, Samaria and Pepper. And then, yes, it's conditional because if you believe, and this is you, so it's Ahaz being talked to here, shall not be established. So you can see there in verse 9, we're talking about Judah, we're not talking about Ephraim. I'm making, I'm laboring this point because this is where Edson um, misses this point, I suppose. So I hope that you can see that structure there and that that all makes sense. Now we're going to talk about what Ahaz did. So did he meet this condition or not? Uh, we know he didn't. So this is what Elamite says from Prophets and Kings, and this is page 329, paragraph 2. Well would it have been for the kingdom of Judah had Ahaz received this message as from heaven. But choosing to lean on the arm of flesh, he sought help from the heathen. In desperation, he sent word to tiglath pileser king of Assyria. I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. The request was accompanied by a rich present from the king's treasure and from the temple storehouse. So this is not good. This is not passing the test. Put the map back up here. that's them running running with temple treasures and king's treasures up to this guy here and saying please save us that is not faith in god so um that's what he did um and then just from what i've learned from wikipedia as well about what tiglath pileser did uh said he acted swiftly he marched his army down the eastern mediterranean coast down here and took the coastal cities all the way to egypt and this cut off his enemy's access to the sea and once this was achieved, he returned to the northern kingdom of Israel, this one here, uh, destroyed their army and deported the Reubenites, Gadites and the people of Manasseh to some places up, up there. And then he installed a Israelite puppet, King Hoshea, in the place of Pekah. And he concluded this extensive campaign by marching north and west, ravaging Aramea, which is Syria, uh, Damascus. He executes Rezin and deports the survivors there to somewhere else as well. So um, Tiglath Pileza does what he's asked. He comes and cleans up the place. Okay, he comes and does some deportations. He gets rid of Pekka. He puts uh, Hoshea on the throne, or at least they work together. I think Hoshea killed Pekka. Um, but uh, I think the Assyrians were, were cool with that. Um, so, you know, you would sort of say it has its problems have all been dealt with and it all looks great. Um, but unfortunately, things are not great. Um, now we'll go on. Um, same passage from Prophets and Kings. The help asked for was sent and King Ahaz was given temporary relief but at what cost to Judah? The tribute offered aroused the cupidity of Assyria. That means an eager desire or a craving. So, yeah, um, I guess it's awakening a desire in these, this king here. And that treacherous nation soon threatened to overflow and spoil Judah. Yeah, here, of course, uh, Ahaz and his unhappy subjects were now harassed by the fear of falling completely into the hands of the cruel Assyrians. So now they've got a bigger problem. <laughs> The Lord brought Judah low because of continued transgression. In this time of chastisement, Ahaz, instead of repenting, trespassed yet more against the Lord, for he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus. Because the gods of the kings of Assyria helped them, he said, therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. Um, yeah, not passing the test. He was supposed to believe in this prophecy and for God's uh, salvation, but he's ended up turning to um, human agents to do the work. And now he's sacrificing to the gods of Damascus. 
as far as I understand, I think he he was up here, here in Damascus meeting to go at the police and he saw um, a, uh, an altar there and he had it copied and made and he was sacrificing on that one. So I think we can safely say it has failed the conditions of belief from Isaiah 7 verse 9. So that's the crisis of 742, context of when that prophecy was given. All right, now I'm going to go into point three. What did the Assyrians do? I just briefly mentioned it, but we'll look at it a bit more. Oh, yes. I'll take a picture. Okay, we'll just be moving through a little bit of history. Uh, now, this is Ephraim's terrible blow. Um, this is, again, just saying the same thing that I just mentioned from Wikipedia as well. This is from Prophets and Kings. Uh, this would be page 287, starting at paragraph 2. In the days of Pekah, who reigned 20 years, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, invaded Israel and carried away with him a multitude of captives from among the tribes living in Galilee and east of the Jordan. That arrow there is deportations or like, um, you know, taking people into exile. They were taken away as well at that point, somewhere around that time. Uh, okay, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh with others of the inhabitants of Gilead and Galilee and the land of Naphtali were scattered among the heathen lands far removed from Palestine. From this terrible blow, the Northern Kingdom never recovered the feeble remnant continued in the forms of government, though no longer possessed of power. Only one more ruler, Hoshea, was to follow Pekah. Soon the kingdom was to be swept away forever. But in that time of sorrow and distress, God still remembered mercy and gave the people another opportunity to turn from idolatry. Okay, so there's going to be a last chance. Uh, Yep. Okay, so Pekah has been killed and replaced by Hoshea. I think put that there. Hezekiah becomes king of Judah. So we're just moving forward a bit in history. Okay, Hezekiah. And, the, and, and we know that Hezekiah has, uh, is going to reinstitute Passover and he sends an invitation up to even people up here. So they've already been suffering somewhat and now there's a way of escape for them because this other punishment is coming, there's going to be more. So he sends up, um, there's a, a big invitation that goes around and this is what Ellen White says about that. Israel should have recognised that this invitation in this invitation, an appeal to repent and turn to God. But the remnant of the ten tribes still dwelling within the territory of the once flourishing northern kingdom uh, treated the royal messengers from Judah with indifference and even with contempt. They laughed them to scorn and mocked them. There were a few, however, who gladly responded. Diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem to keep the feast of unleavened bread. So, yeah, you get some people actually coming over here. Uh, about two years later, Samaria was invested by the hosts of Assyria under Shalmaneser. We've got a new king there as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay, so under Shalmaneser comes over here. And in the siege that followed, multitudes perished miserably of hunger and disease, as well as by the sword. The city and nation fell, and the broken remnant of the ten tribes were carried away captive and scattered in the provinces of the Assyrian realm. So, yeah, Hoshea had um, conspired with the king of Egypt against Assyria. So he's taken captive and put in prison. 
And then Shamanese procedure Samaria for three years and takes it. And so there's more deportations and resettling the area. So that's here. Okay. That really is their last thing. Um, there's a few people left there. Um, struggling on bad making and those are just been two deportations now of people, which is like um, we, we consider that to be like a form of genocide. If you take a group of people and scatter them away, um, that, that's like um, genocide. Uh, trying to get rid of that group of people from existence by spreading them out and um, getting them to dilute their heritage down. So, okay, going forward now, Manasseh, now we're talking about the Southern Kingdom as well. So moving forward in time, we've got Hezekiah has now died and Manasseh's Uh, he comes and actually murders Isaiah. So Isaiah's gone. Um, and he's murdered others as well of prophets. But these group of prophets begin to warn about a Babylonian captivity. So now we're introducing another nation as well. Okay, those prophets come and talk to Manasseh. I will read some more from Prophets and Kings. This is page 382.2. Some of those who suffered persecution during Manasseh's reign were commissioned to bear special messages of reproof and judgment, of judgment. The king of Judah, the prophets declared, had done wickedly above all which were before him. Because of this wickedness, his kingdom was nearing a crisis. Soon the inhabitants of the land were to be carried captive to Babylon there to become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. All right, so uh, let's look at Assyria. We have Esarhaddon in power now. Um, um, they've got a temporary capital in Babylon. So I've just swapped in a bit for Babylon, but it's still Assyria. Um, what else did I mark? Okay, so he um, he comes to the lands of Israel and Judah, and he carries away the last remnant remnant of Eph Ephraim. Yeah. So this is here. Um, So um, let me just see. Okay, so I've just drawn that up. Makes uh, okay. So he makes will be, uh, so he's carried away the last remnant of Ephraim. So they didn't have a king or anything, but there was a few people there. Uh, and now, really, they're just not there anymore. So that's the end of them. It makes war with Jerusalem. So I'll keep reading now um, from that Prophets and Kings passage. Faithfully, the prophets continued their warnings and their exhortations. Fearlessly, they spoke to Manasseh and to his people. But the messages were scorned. Backsliding Judah would not heed. As an earnest, um, earnest means token, 
of what would befall the people, should they continue impenitent, the Lord permitted their king to be captured by a band of Assyrian soldiers who bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon, their temporary capital. So they've taken him over here. Uh, that's Man Manasseh. Manasseh. All right. uh, now, this is interesting because he's a token of what's to come. So he's taken to Babylon. So we know that the, the um, people are going to be taken to Babylon, but this is earlier. And this is an amazing type of what will happen to the people. The listeners I read on. This affliction brought the king to his senses. He besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. But this repentance, remarkable though it was, came too late to save the kingdom from the corrupting influence of years of idolatrous practices. Many had stumbled and fallen never to, again to rise. I really want to highlight here that um, the name comes up here. And he's praying and he's sorry. And then he comes back. He comes back to Jerusalem. So this is a really, really wonderful type of what's going to happen to um, the, the Jews when they go to Babylon. We know there's a prayer here, um, Daniel's prayer, um, and then the people are brought back. So Manasseh is a really great illustration of what's going to happen, not just that he's captured but also his return. And then we know in the future they're, they're going to be, there's more years past, there's more warnings, and the Jews end up getting um, taken to Babylon. So that's what the Assyrians did. Okay, so that's just a little bit of history that we're going to, we have to just put in place before we look at how Miller saw this prophecy and how Edson saw this prophecy as well. So he's got the two verses there. I just wrote them up to remind us. Uh, Miller's, uh, obviously, he's saying that the 65-year prophecy has something to do with the 2520. It's really, um, it's it's connected. It really is um, part of the same story. And he's looking at 1843 as being the second advent, the end of captivity for him. So this is um, 677 to 1843. 1843 is a great counterpart to 677 because this is going to be the second advent of be released from captivity and this is when the beginning of captivity happened. At 677, um, there was a scattering of these people here um, and the beginning of trouble for uh, the Southern Kingdom as well. Uh, now, he calculates um, what is what happens 65 years after this prophecy was given, so that fits in really nice as well. Okay, 
so that's that matches really well at 65 years later 677 that's perfect um, and he applies this to both Ephraim and Judah we can see this fulfilled in both So I'll read, I've just written some of the terms he uses are these ones. So I just wrote them there for you as well. I'll stand over here so you can see. Okay, so this is Miller's Works, Volume 1. Isaiah prophesied that within 65 years, Ephraim should be broken and not a people. This was in the days of Pekah and Rezin, uh, 742 years before Christ. 65 years afterwards, BC 677, Esarhaddon, king of Assyria and Babylon came with a large army into the land of Israel and Judah, carried away the last remnant of Israel and they had not been a nation since. And then he also made war against Jerusalem, took Manasseh and carried him to Babylon, which begins the seven times Judah was to be in bondage to the kings of the earth and also the seven years Israel should be a captive, robbed and spoiled people. So he's, he's mentioning both nations. You can see that um, there. Judah was going to be in bondage and there's seven years that Israel should be a captive or robbed and spoiled people because from here onwards, oh, sorry, here onwards, um, they've been scattered, okay. Uh, Manasseh's capture coincides with the final dispersion of northern Israel, this one here, uh, the third red one. So you take 677 as the date and Miller connects the 65-year prophecy to both the kingdoms. That's quite clear, I think, from what I've read then. So that was fine. That's all good. Uh, but Edson doesn't do that. Can you take a picture for me? Okay. Um, I'm just going to rub this one out because he doesn't really talk about it. He's focusing on this one. Okay, so Isaiah 7 verse 8 here. Uh, he's going to focus on that verse. He, he knows that the 65 years is connected to the 2520 as well. He's thinking 1798, a bit different. For him, the end of captivity isn't the second advent, it's the end of the dark ages. So he still sees end of captivity there and he thinks that's a really great counterpart to captivity here. Uh, and he's going to say, all the emphasis here is on the word within. Okay, so um, we'll just call it 723 BC is within 65 years from 32. Okay. So that's that seems logical to him. He sees the word within there. So yeah, it fits quite well. And this is the amazingness of God's word, I suppose, that you know you can argue both ways on this verse. Um, so within uh, makes it possible for him to argue this point. Um, and so he's going to say this is just Ephraim only. He's not going to, he's going to argue against you actually. I'll draw all this out and then I'll read you what he wrote. Uh, so by the yeah, I need to Ephraim. Okay, so just having laid that out, I'll read you what he said. Mm, what's the best place to stand here? Okay, so this is from the Times of the Gentiles, January the 10th, 1856. Um, it's starting page 113 uh, and going on from there. I think, oh no, I don't know that number. Anyway, but yeah, that's where the article is, January 10, 1846. In this prophecy of Isaiah 7-8, this one, 
the 65 year prophecy we've been talking about, it is predicted that within, not at the close of, but within, and we put that in cap, all caps, capital letters, within three score and five years, Ephraim, again in all caps, not Judah in brackets, shall be broken, that it be not a people. He's really strong on this, he's really fighting. Manasseh was king of Judah, hence neither he nor the tribe of Judah are embraced in this prophecy. Okay, so it can't be Manasseh because he's not part of Ephraim. So he takes, then he goes and he takes three passages in the Bible that talk about Judah being set apart as God's special people. He's like, his remnant. And then he says, from the above three important testimonies, it is clear that the taking of Manasseh, king of Judah, among the thorns and binding him in fetters and carrying him to Babylon 677 BC cannot be the event nor point from which to reckon the seven times. Furthermore, it is written that Manasseh humbled himself and was restored back again, reigned over Judah in Jerusalem till the day of his death and was then succeeded by his son. And we have the account of a continued succession of the kings of Judah. So the fact that Manasseh was restored is also part of his argument. And then he talks about the fact that Judah was eventually scattered in the future. So I'm not sure whether he meant by the Romans later or um, Babylon. But from the foregoing considerations, we are unavoidably driven off from the taking of Manasseh, king of Judah, bound to Babylon 677 as the point from which to reckon the seven times. He lists a number of passages that speak about the taking of Ephraim into captivity. So he just puts a few Bible quotes about how um, this event happened for Ephraim here in 723. Um, and then he concludes, this then is the inspired historical event, this one, uh, which is 723 BC. It is the point from which to reckon that 2,520 years of captivity. <clears throat> Instead of reckoning from the taking of Manasseh, king of Judah to Babylon, we reckon from the shutting up and binding in prison Hosea, king of Israel, which was 723. This was 19 years after Isaiah's prophecy in chapter, uh, you know, Isaiah 7 verse 8, which was 742 BC. Hence, Ephraim was broken from being a people literally within three score and five years. And we have a historical record of a corresponding event. This here corresponds to this one. Um, in the year 1798, which perfectly answers the fulfilment of the predictions of the prophets which have foretold the events which mark the end of the 25, 20 years, indignation and captivity. So that's his point of view. That's how he's done it. And what we're saying here is that, you know, most of what he's saying is pretty good, but he's written off um, Miller's point of view completely um, in his efforts to argue for his own one and uh, he's sort of thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So that's that. So to summarise Edson's uh, mistake, he totally dismissed Miller's perspective. He focused on Isaiah 7 verse 8 and he missed the significance of the next verse, which was verse 9, which is talking about um, punishment on Judah. He missed the significance of the rest of the chapter, so chapter 7 as well, and into verse 8, which was all pronunciations against Judah. He also missed the significance of the number 65 because he says it's within 65 years. It just means the number 65 has no relevance. It could be any number. Um, so he didn't really, um, really consider why 65 was mentioned at all. Uh, he ends up focusing on the host. He does focus on the host a lot in his articles and he misses the significance of the trampling of the sanctuary. So he ends up with half the picture, unfortunately, and um, that's his mistake. So that's not, not to criticise him again. The point isn't to disparage him. His work is quite amazing. But we need to clarify these points because we're going to be fixing some of these little things up and then bringing them together. So we need to know... Um, what, what we're fixing up, I suppose, what we're building on, what we're keeping and what we're adjusting. Um, so winding up now, this relevance to all of us. I might just, yeah, I will, I'll go, we'll take a picture and then I'll clean it and draw it a bit more.
Okay, so each of them got an incomplete picture. But um, their work is still good and useful for the most part, yeah. Um, um, we need to also remember that it was really hard. It was hard for them. They actually did an amazing job if you consider, um, you know, the, the, the bubble verses are hard to understand. And uh, when you're in the middle of a situation, you're trying to interpret things, um, it is difficult. And then when you have the right answer, it's easy to look back and say, it all seems so simple now. But while you're working through it, it can take ages to come to terms with the Bible verse or something you're studying. I think we all experience it that when we wrestle with something that we're trying to learn in the Bible. And um, when it finally clicks, it seems like a no-brainer, but at the time doing all that work, um, it's difficult. So we'll give them a break for that. Um, we need to appreciate the logic that, especially with Miller, trying to make things fit according to the uh, expectation of the second advent. There was a logic there and a pretty good process as well. Um, so, what was oh yes, so appreciate the logic. Uh, and then we build on the work. Okay, so by building on, what does it mean to build on their work? What we're going to do, you're going to get, you're going to get Miller's one and Edson's one. Okay. We're going to get their work and we're going to start stitching them together. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And to stitch them together, we just need to do a little bit of tidying up just on a couple of those points that I brought forward today. Um, but most of the work is done and just needs that little bit last step, really. So um, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, so I spend a lot of time on the 65 years today and not just um, for this purpose, but also we need to know the 65 year prophecy because we need to understand what happened in 74, 742 BC. We need to actually remember that later. We'll be coming back around to the Confederacy in 742, the Northern, um, those two nations in the North coming against the South. The fact that there's a confederation is important. And the fact that in the South, there was a rejection of the prophet, um, a rejection of the prophet. And that was Isaiah when the, um, Ahaz had rejected that message and gone um, to seek help from the Assyrians. So we need to remember that event as well. So I really wanted to get that story in there for later, just, um, just lay all that ground, groundwork. Um, and they, yeah, yeah, there's 46 years um, as well. So we know, um, we now know it's 46 year period between 723 and 677. It's not 45 like Miller had said um, at the other end of the 2520. So it's 46, um, that number is significant and the number 65, how that all ties together um, is important later as we look at the structure of the 2520. So that's how the 65 year prophecy fits in with all of that model. Um, that's why I really wanted to hammer that home. I hope it's clear. Um, so, and then, yeah, that's really it. And then next time we talk, we'll go into the Gospels, Revelation and Daniel, and we'll begin this process of trying to um, prove how they're knitted together as well. So on that note, I will close in prayer and then I'll answer any questions and can, we'll do, do that, okay? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the protection you had over our Fijian brothers and sisters. Um, that's really wonderful news um, that nobody was lost in that um, storm. So we thank you so much for your gracious answer to prayer and your protection over them. We also pray for ourselves um, that you would help us to be established in this, um, this story of the 2520, help us to understand um, 
to understand how it works, to understand how it fits together and to have all that in place so that as we go forward into the way we apply it today, um, that we will have that foundation to build on. So we thank you for being with us and for blessing us and helping us as we listen and learn and as um, different ones present. We know you're guiding us and opening trees up to us and we, we hope that we will be ready for whatever is to come. Um, thank you so much and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen.